Hey guys, Budcat7 here. Okay, it is Friday, October 18, 2019, and I want to thank you for visiting the Stonewall Research Channel here on YouTube. Thank you very much. I really do appreciate it. All right, friends, we're going to keep on looking at the quote-unquote giants, or large hominids, as I prefer to call them, state by state, and the next state is going to be New York. And, um, you know, thank goodness... I. You have these accounts and articles and uh, town histories and other sort of research that's compiled here into one place. There's an awful lengthy list of them here in New York, quite a few of them. And uh, maybe, what, 25 accounts or something like that. So it's, it's quite a bit. And uh, before I even really get into it, I just came across this very interesting video here on... Do the dog-headed men have souls? Question mark. Letter from 9th century monk. Now, you know, I get recommended videos from YouTube or whatever, so I took a look at this thing, and, you know, I don't know, but, you know, do we really know the past, do we? In the 9th century, famed Carolingian theologian Ratchamnus was written a letter inquiring as to whether the kynocephaly, the dog-headed men, had souls. Here we bring you his considered response, taking into account the many different examples of creatures on earth known to him at that time. And one of those uh, classifications of creatures was uh, giants. So... Just interesting, this sino or sinocephaly or kinocephaly, the dog-headed man. Are we talking about reports of people with weird skull shapes elsewhere in the world in the ninth, as late, you know, as uh, late as the ninth century? I mean, I don't know, you know, but we're going to talk about that a little bit. It's interesting that something like that is said in this article here um, from the Burlington News, which covers all kinds of paranormal stuff and whatnot, and uh, I guess out of Vermont or New Hampshire or whatever up there. And um, it's just fascinating to me that people put together all this stuff, but there's some things that are said in here, and I guess this is compiled, the, the um, Burlington News has like uh, categories of the whole giant aspect of research and whatnot, so this is one of the segments of it here, the giants of New York, monsters from the mound, but I uh, just there's some interesting things said in here that I just you know make note of, but you know, and of course I you know what guys I think reading if you do any sort anybody knows anything about it when you read there's more retention value to reading, you know this is, you know of course when it's in focus and whatnot, but. This, you know, you retain more when you read stuff than just simply watching stuff. I think there's a lot of research on that, too. But listen to what they say in this, okay? So let's take a look at this thing here, okay? Some old historians dis reports of bizarre finds from western New York, but most acknowledge mystery. We should be suspicious of stories from frontier papers that stood to gain plenty from tall tales. These are, are from historical texts. When the whites arrived, western New York was littered with the works of earlier peoples. Get this, stone walls, graded rows, and fortifications were reported, though most commonly these markers were earthen mounds or enclosures, okay? So it's just interesting to me that the first thing that they put on here are the stone walls, okay? Because I believe, Jimmy the Paleo Mountain Man believes, and I think maybe a few other people believe, that the stone walls are from a time before what we can currently consider the Native Americans, okay, that there were ancestors who were here, 
And it just so happens that, you know, just that several thousand years ago, these people that were there, like were found in the Dina and Hopewell Mounds. And when you go through this, you just see New York was littered with mounds, but they don't exist today. So, you know, other than these reports and whatnot, I mean, you have to either believe them or not. Some of them weren't investigated and the mounds were destroyed and whatnot. And we just can't look at that anymore so seems like new york was another place just littered with mounds but the point is is that the stone walls and there's several historical accounts that mention the stone walls being there already and that's why i say at van rensselaer in upstate new york where he was running this patroon if you don't know what a patroon is this is sort of lord manor and this indentured servants working on the land and whatnot when van rensselaer set up his patroon in upstate new york dutch patroon he just it was easy for him to put people into those areas because he had the stone walls there to demarcate all the land already see so it was a simple matter he, had he designed it himself or anybody else for that matter it would have been in even geometric shapes not these crazy erratic irregular patterns where it, it when you look at the walls in up uh, in uh, new york and new england okay there doesn't seem to be an end to them. So who's, you know, if you just sat in the middle there, who whose wall would you be building? So besides that, the walls were already there as reported in a number of historical reports, and they were probably built by these large hominids who seemed to be dug up all over New England and everywhere else in this country. So from that, you know, several thousand years ago period. So you just have to be aware of that. Okay, so the stone walls are in this whole story of the large hominids and all the dolmen up there and split stones here and there. Very many things in upstate um, uh, New York, Vermont, New Hampshire, Connecticut, everywhere around that just all evidence of these large hominids being there. Okay. The Native Americans seldom had any tradition about the people who had put them in place. Most of us now believe that the influence of the Mississippian mound builder culture was behind them. So just as I say, same same peoples the settlement and the plow have been lethal to most of these fragile works and even the old mound fanatic e.g squire confessed ruefully in 1849 that the western door had little any more worth looking at and e.g squire was the guy who did the collection from the boston ladies there five thousand dollars to repair the serpent mound and uh get it all squared away because uh, he felt that that needed to be conserved thanks to him we have it today and the ladies who got the five thousand dollars i went over in one of my videos there on my channel as these words were destroyed in the last century, a stable full of curiosity seems to have come out. Tiopoli and Cheney notes in illustrations of the ancient monuments of western New York that a 12-foot-high elliptical mound among Cataraugus County, Conowango Valley, held eight big skeletons. Most crumbled, but a thigh bone was found to be 28 inches long. Exquisite stone points, enamel work, and jewelry like that of Mexico or Peru. So you see that in there. That's very interesting. Like that of Mexico or Peru. We're also unearthed in the area. The mound looked like those of the old world. So it's another one of these barrow mounds, which often have this like trench on the outside, but not all of them do. But they look like these bell barrow and bow barrow that seem identical in Europe. 
But this whole thing where, you know, the ones in Europe have to be earlier, and they often aren't when they do the research. The Beaker people existed almost at the same time as the Adena people. So that, in my mind, suggests something, okay? But, you know, you make of it what you want. Cheney also mentions a skeleton seven foot five with an unusually thick skull from a Chautauqua County site near Casadaga Creek. Inside a very old mound near Casadaga Lake were some large skeletons that were examined by medical gentlemen. One measured nearly nine feet. In 1938, Charles Huntington of Randolph was so inspired by Doc Cheney's finds that he made two giant wooden Indian statues, probably still at the museum in Little Valley. A history of Cattaraugus County notes that the town of Carrollton, Fort Limestone, whose rough figure eight enclosed five acres. In 1851, the removal of a stump turned up a mass of human bones. Some were enormous. Franklinville, Marvin Older virtually gambled about the site with them. A skull fit over his size seven and a half head, a rib curved all the way around him, a shin bone went from his ankle to above his knee, and a jaw with bodacious molars went over his own. Its first owner had probably stood eight feet tall. Stafford Cleveland, his, Cleveland's History and Directory of Yates County refers to skeletons from a conical burial mound by Cougar Lake in the early 1800s. A Pennsylvanian doctor found that there were they, many were seven-footers. Tales of ghosts and buried treasure cling to this vicinity as well. Turner's history of, Hall, of the Holland Purchase reports an ancient three-acre earth fort in Orleans County, about one and a half miles west of Shelby Center, which is the middle of nowhere, that covered seven and eight-foot skeletons. Their skulls were well-developed in front, broad between the ears, and flattened on top. Also, Turner notes that upon digging a cellar on his own in his town of Aurora Farm, Charles P. Pearson found a giant of his own. The 1879 history of Allegheny County noted a circular mound between Phillips Creek and the Genesee in the village of Belmont, several feet high and 15 or so in diameter. It disgorged human bones, some very large, when the railroad was made in 1849 and 1850, so another mound destroyed. So, <clears throat> just repeated reports of these mounds in New York State, which is just like none to be found here anymore. So, you know, they can claim anything. Well, it's, you know, what mounds? We don't see any, and just claim all these reports are baloney. That's all they have to do. Guys like Dr. Ken Fader, who is, you know, basically a douche. Giant human skeletons don't ring any bells with us. Some think the Scandinavians were in western New York, and they were considered virtual giants in the ancient world, whose people were traditionally much shorter than those now. Many Vikings would seem tall even today, but they were not routinely seven-footers. Not all the, this is what's interesting here, and back to the dog men again. Not all the human-like skeletons found about the western door were so surely human. Several old histories discuss the two very bizarre skulls taken in the early 1820s from a mound on Tonawanda Island near Buffalo. One early writer notes each portentous protruding lower jaw and canine forehead. Another adds that the burial customs were entirely unlike those of the region's natives. Our Country and Its People, Truancy White, 1898, mentioned skeletons that seem to have been platycinemic, platycinemic, flat-shinned. In the bluff at Fort Porter, Buffalo, one such skeleton was found near ancient implements. 
Burials of up to three such skeletons have been found high up on the river or lake banks about the region. Their flat shins and their other skeletal peculiarities were thought due to climbing and living in trees. These are odd stories to make up. Okay, so it says that right there. In nature's evidence experiments towards Homo sapiens, some of the discontinued models were very large. Gigantic Polythicus, Gigantopithecus comes to mind. None are thought to have set foot or dragged knuckle on any American soil. Just steam in Montezuma Serpent sites finds from the American Southwest implying some giant bestial hominid was here. Jim Brandon's Weird America lists two such accounts from just outside the western door. An eight-footer turned up in Ellisburg, PA mound near Wellsville, New York in 1886. The same year, a team of professors and professionals found dozens of huge, oddly skulled humans in mounds in Sayre, Pennsylvania near Elmira, New York. They averaged seven feet, though some were taller, and some had horny knobs on their foreheads. Several went to the American Investigating Museum in Philadelphia, in which to, in, into which they disappeared. <laughs> so you get that there. They disappeared. Again, this is why we'll never know the true history, because it all got disappeared, folks. Modern fans of Bigfoot seem seen in almost all the states of the Union, might rejoice at historical testimony of monster bones. For the rest of us, the matter is just weird. Okay, so it goes on to give some credit here. Mason C. Winfield is the author of Shadows of the Western Door, a research survey of Western New York's paranormal mysteries. The book included information on ghosts, UFOs, Bigfoot, ancient mysteries, giant skeletons, secret societies, cult activity, etc. Shadows of the Western Door is available at Buffalo Books. Niagara's Ancient Cemetery of Giants. <clears throat> I respected the spelling used in the text. Friedenberg is first used and later is spelled Friedenberg. The site was about 40 miles west of Niagara Falls, according to recent maps. Dunville is at the mouth of the Grand River, which flows into Lake Erie. A, quote, Six Nations, First Nation, territory, unquote, is along the Grand River today, but I cannot say if the site was in it or out of it. More information is needed to flesh out the veracity to this story, which 21st century readers may take with a grain of salt. Headlines, a remarkable site, 200 skeletons of Anakin in Cayuga Township, a singular discovery by a Tor Torontonian and others. A vast Golgotha opened to view. Some remains of the giants that were in those days from our own correspondence. Cayuga, August 21st. On Wednesday last, Reverend Nathaniel Ward Wardell, Mrs. Messrs. Oren Wardell of Toronto and Daniel Friedenberg were digging in the on the farm of the latter gentleman, which is on the banks of the Grand River in the township of Cayuga. When they got to five or six feet below the surface, a strange sight met them, piled in layers, one upon top of the other, some 200 skeletons of human beings nearly perfect, around the neck of each one be, being a string of beads. So could this be one of these giant genocides that were done against